let's move to installing our Dell server. And as you can see here, it's booting up. It's a PowerEdge 2600. It's got embedded server management, as well as other components, including multiple hard drives and a RAID controller. It's also got two 2400 MHz processors, or 2.4 GHz processors, and it's a dual processor system. So now the hard drives are being detected. And there they are, three Fujitsus with two LSI logic interfaces and a PowerVolt backplane. So here's the main interface, the main window. And from here we can interact with the kernel and the installation process. We can install by simply pressing enter, or we can upgrade or install in text mode by inserting or entering Linux based text which will provide us with a text based installer or you can use the function keys below to get more information such as providing options interacting with the kernel general information or to enter the rescue mode of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux CD. This is CD 1 of 5 in the set. You may also download a DVD ISO image and install everything from a DVD drive if your server has one. Our server has only a CD drive, so we will install from the CDs. Again, if there's a problem booting your Linux system, then you can press F5 to enter rescue mode and attempt to mount the root file system and repair whatever boot problems you may encounter. Apart from that, simply press enter and this will begin the installation process. So let's move forward. Again, this is a basic installation using CDs. As you can see, multiple drivers are being loaded at this stage after the kernel has performed some initialization steps. And these are generic drivers to provide support for connected hardware. Doesn't mean that your system has those drivers per se, but these are the commonly found drivers on systems. Now, as, as we've always seen in classic Red Hat fashion, the utility or ability to test the CDs or installation media before moving forward. So here we can perform a surface test of the first CD before using it for installation, subsequently re resulting in a failure if there are bad sectors on the CD. If you're confident in your media, your installation media, then simply skip it by moving the arrow key over to the right and moving forward. So we'll skip, and this will proceed with the installation process. If your VGA card has been detected by the installer, the installation program will start in graphical mode. Otherwise, if it doesn't recognize the VGA card, it'll be in text mode. It's found it, ATI Technologies, Rage XL. And now we've got the graphical installation screen. So again, just like with other versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, if the Anaconda installer software detects your graphical card, your graphics card, it will then provide graphical support as we see here. So that means you'll have the ability to use the mouse and the keyboard to interact with the installation process. Release notes are located in the lower left. You click on this just to see if there are any er issues or items that may pertain to your hardware. Scroll through it just to see if you've got a wheel mouse, wheel down as we've got in this particular case. And you'll see there's various information regarding the installation of this version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now we've scrolled down quite a bit, which is why it's taking a while to redisplay. And if there's nothing that's of interest, as is the case for our system, since we've installed it many times with this version, we'll just close, which returns us to the main menu, giving us the ability to move forward. So we'll click on Next. This will take us or advance us to the next step of the installation, which is to select a language to be used during the installation process. The language selection here pertains only to the installation, not to the running system. Some folks may want to install in another language and operate using multiple language support, which is the default support or the default language framework or environment for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Once you've got the Latin 
character set install, you have support for all the Latin-based languages anyway. But for the installation process, you can determine what language you'd like to use. So we'll move forward with English. And now we need to ensure that we indicate the, the appropriate keyboard, and it is US English, so that the keys match the set that is there. Now we get a pop-up regarding an installation number. If you have a subscription with Red Hat, which is highly suggested, highly recommended, then you'll want to insert the installation number here. The installation number provides you with access to updates to packages, as it tells you here. So, since we'll be using the basic installation, for now we'll skip entering an installation number. But in addition to updates, which your subscription provides, there are other packages that you cannot install without an installation number. Again, if you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux in your environment, check with your systems administrator for the installation number information. You should have coverage per system so that you're entitled to or have access to packages that are applicable as well as updates once once the system's up and running and by updates we mean security updates uh, patches we'll click on OK to skip installing it tells you here if you're unable to in locate the installation number you should consult redhat.com if you skip you may not get access to a full set it may result in unsupported installation and you won't get any software and security updates for the packages including your subscription so you won't get security updates you may not be able to get support if you call Red Hat up with help, or asking for help, that is. And you may not get access to the full set of packages included. We'll click on Skip anyway, because our intent and purpose here is to simply show you how to march through the installation process using local media. Now you see the hard drives that have been detected on the system. It tells us that there are three of them, SDA, B, and C SCSI disks, are indicated using SDA or SD and beginning with the first letter of the alphabet, so SDA through SDZ, whereas IDE at TAPI based hard drives are listed using HDA or HDA through Z. So in this case we see SDAs through C, which means there are three disks. There's an option above to remove Linux partitions and only Linux partitions and create a default layout. But if you click on the drop box you'll see that you can remove all partitions on the selected drives and create a default layout. The default layout is the suggested layout by the installer which we'll see momentarily. We'll use it again as it works for our intensive purposes. You may also use free space on selected drives and create the default layout. So if you don't want to remove or you want to avoid removing any of the partitions for fear of losing data, you may select this option, use free space on selected drives and create default layout. But this assumes, of course, that there is free space. If there is no free space, the installation program will complain. You may also create a custom layout, which we'll be doing later on as well. So for now, let's go ahead with removing all partitions on selected drives and create a default layout. Again, there's a link for advanced storage configuration. If you'd like to add, for example, an iSCSI target, which is a remotely accessible disk using the iSCSI protocol, you can do so at this stage. So iSCSI is built in, or iSCSI client support is built in. That is the ability to mount iSCSI targets across the wire. Ideally, you should ensure that you have at least gigabit connectivity to your iSCSI targets. And you can review and modify the partitioning layout after you've elected one of the options here. So the options in this drop box above are basically wizards, minus, of course, the custom or create custom partition layout. Let's click on Next. We'll just work with the three drives and it tells you you've chosen to remove all partitions, which means all data, on the following drives. And we'll move forward and tell it that this is okay because there's no data that we'd like to preserve. So let's click on yes and move forward. Now we move on to network configuration. Here are the interfaces that have been detected now. This server has three network interfaces, one gigabit, two 100 base T interfaces, or two fast Ethernet interfaces. ETH0 is the default interface. Unless you indicate a static IP address, one will be assigned using DHCP, providing, of course, there's a DHCP server on the network. If you do want to set a static address, 
then you can do so below by setting the host name as well as miscellaneous settings as well as by editing the interface. Or you can have a partial dynamic and static configuration where some items such as the host name as well as gateway DNS systems are derived using DHCP while other items such as the static IP address net mask are assigned manually. So you can mix and match or you can blend but usually for a server class system you'll want to go with a static base setting which means you would have spent the time beforehand determining which IP scheme is to be assigned to the server depending on its placement of course in your network environment. So let's go ahead and click on edit. Again when you click on edit you can enable IP version 4 support using manual or, st or DHCP static DHCP, so static manual or DHCP dynamic configuration. With manual configuration you're forced to indicate an IP version 4 address. So we need to indicate, we said we'd go with 195. Let's specify 192.168, 75.195, and we should also be sure that this address doesn't exist on the network before using it, for obvious reasons. The net mask that is to be applied is to, is to be done, or to be applied or indicated using CIDR notation. So specify the number of bits, the number of octal bits that are to be enabled. Since we have a standard class C network, the number of octal bits translates to 24, so it's at slash 24. This may or may not match your environment. Get from your systems administrator, or if you're the systems administrator, apply the CIDR notation net mask accordingly. Whether or not you'd like to enable IPv6 support, the default is to have it enabled, which uses neighbor discovery, which means it'll find the Cisco 1811 router and self-configure with an IPv6 address. You may also use DHCP version 6 or manually configure a 128-bit IPv6 address in the event that you have a manual environment. It isn't suggested, however, since most environments provide access to a router, such as a Cisco router, which supports IPv6, the suggested configuration methodology is to use the router to assign the prefixes and let the host determine its IPv6 64-bit part of the address using its MAC address as well as whatever other bits, the other 16 bits, whether from 64 or from other methodologies. The idea, again, is that you want the operating system to automatically assign its unique IPv6 address, but in some environments, in some rare instances, you may want to control the IPv6 address manually. So with that said, we're going to apply 192.168.75.195 with a slash 24-bit prefix, meaning it will be a 255.255.255.0 subnet mask. So now we've got the address assigned. Now notice we're forced to select the manual option for assigning a host name as well as gateway primary DNS, secondary DNS, but these settings can be overridden. The installer doesn't allow you to mix and match, but the operating system does. But to avoid confusion, the assumption is if you've assigned an address to an interface, one or more interfaces manually, you'll want to assign host name, gateway, and DNS information manually. So with that said, let's indicate the host's name. We said we would name this system Linux CBT Serve 2 dot Linux CBT dot internal. The installer will take care of placing this information into the appropriate files on the operating system. You'll see later on in ETC hosts, for example, that the fully qualified as well as the short name will exist in the ETC hosts file. So the installer populates the appropriate files or the files accordingly. The gateway is your default gateway, the way out of your subnet or out of your VLAN and that's 192.168.75.1. The primary DNS server, as we've mentioned, we've got an all-purpose network infrastructure system which runs DHCP and DNS. It is, it is the SUSE Enterprise 10 box and it has an IP address of .100, if you recall from our graphics. So it's 192.168.75.100. If there were other DNS servers in the, in the environment, we'd specify it here for secondary DNS.